to the Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Jim Russo of Zhongding Tai Chi Chuan. Jim has over half a century of experience in Tai Chi, Xing Yi, Qigong, and related arts. Uh, he's trained with some of the biggest uh, names in the martial arts in uh, this country, and he shares his methods and insights on his YouTube channel and blog, as well as via a online uh, weekly teaching program at Chongding, uh, ChongdingTaiChi.com. Jim, hello. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, thanks for talking with us today. So I guess the first question, the most obvious question that I ask everybody is, um, how did you come how did you come to be involved in the martial arts in the first place what made you seek out martial arts well a lot of people it was you know david carradine and bruce lee <laughs> yeah but more more than that my cousin john airy did karate and judo and when i would go to his house he would have me down in the basement in a horse stance with indian clubs doing punches or practicing judo throws with like a belt against a column in the garage or the basement. So he got me started in it initially. And then because of the basic thing, you know, the Bruce Lee thing and everything else, everybody in my neighborhood that was my age pretty much started doing something. And by just sheer luck, the, um, the son of the founder of Tong Sudo, John Cho Huang, his brother-in-law, Chang Bok Chung, was the physical education director in our YMCA. Wow. So my first teacher was John Cho Huang, which was Huang Ki's son, the founder of Tung Sudo. And, you know, I had to beg my parents to let me go study. And they finally acquiesced and I went to study there. And, you know, when you leave there, me and my friends would just, you know, free spar and play around and reenact scenes from Enter the Dragon. <laughs> I pretty much do that sort of stuff for quite a while. But like the David Carradine whole, you know, herbalist, doctor, philosopher vibe like that, that bit me pretty hard. And so I've always was interested in it from that standpoint. And I was very awkward in regular sports. Like no one in my family did sports really, but me. And as a result, I really wasn't that good. And the town I lived in was like state champions in, in like football for like six years in a row. Like I ran track with Butch Wolfolk, who was uh, a, in the Detroit Lions and the New York Giants and, you know, state champions and just like crazy athletes. But martial arts like vibes with me right away. I skipped three belts in Tung Sudo, testing under Hyun Cho Huang and also um, Chun Sik Kim, who's the current head of the American Tung Sudo Muda Kwan Society uh, Federation or whatever they call it. Um, and all the brother-in-laws, like Chang Bok Chung and Yong Ki Hong and all that. So I, I learned, I tend to learn this stuff quickly and then just obsess over it every day of my life and train and train and train and train and what have you. So that was my original introduction. And Tung Sudo, the highest form in Tung Sudo is called Sip Sam Se which means 13 postures. And if you know the history of Huang Ki, he studied with, I think it was Yang Xiao Hu's son in Manchuria, they called it. Right. And um, so I, I was, I had respiratory problems and was like, I got to, I had heard about Cheng Manching from my cousin when I was a boy. So I was like, I, I want to, see if William Chen's around because I read about him in Robert Smith's book, Chinese Boxing Masters and Methods. Right. And I went to Williams and I learned his form in two weeks. And he found out on the third week that I could do it because someone told him. And he said, let me see. And I did it. So he gave me like carte blanche to any of his classes so I could do push hands levels one, two, and three, 
Sancho, one, two, and three, sword, all that stuff. And, you know, I taught myself the long form from Yang Cheng Fu's book with the line drawings in it yeah. in two weeks also. And um, he heard that from Sandra Lovegrove, a senior student of mine who was studying privately with him, a senior sister of mine, rather, who was studying with him for like 17 years privately. So I was practicing during their private lesson on the landing outside of the school. And he opened the door and said, Sandra tells me you can do the long form. And I was like, well, and I can do the sequence of it. It's a train wreck, but I could do it. So he said, let me see. I went in and did it. So it's always been that kind of a situation with me. So B.P. Chan taught in Williams School. Yeah. And so did Dr. Tao Ping Xiang, who was a senior student of uh, Cheng Man Cheng. So really, even though I've got multiple teachers, they all come from the same root, essentially. And like William, when Dr. Tao came to America, William was like, why aren't you studying with him? And I was like, who? Like, I was so old school. I was like, I don't see anyone else here. You know, and he was like, no, he's really good. You should study with him. So I took his course that he was teaching. It was like a weekly thing. And when that was done, I asked to do privates. And I did privates with me and William's son, Max, and Dr. Tao just doing push hands for like several years. And then, you know, my brother had died of AIDS. And I saw a thing in Inside Kung Fu about Tai Chi ruler being good for T cells. And yeah. So I ordered this video from someone out in, in like Seattle. I get the video and I'm like, huh, who is this guy in this video? And it was BP Chan. Yeah. So I was like, boy, that name is so familiar because he taught in my school. Yeah. You know, so then once I saw that he was teaching there and I saw like the, encyclopedic knowledge he had and not just that but like the pedigree of it yeah i was like i was i was looking at at acupuncture schools at the time and i was very unimpressed with everyone i met and once i saw mr chan and his pedigree and like his refinement i was like i'm going here so i made it my intention to learn everything he taught which was like and i never learned at all like right. it's too much you know, but I, I learned the Yang family Tai Chi Tron, which includes the sand show and the big knife and the spear and the staff and the two person staff and you know, the various push hands and the various gong fa training for different levels of training. And um, also the Dong family fast form. And he also taught an old version of Chen style. And uh, the Xing Yi, I was very into the Yichuan and Xing Yi because I knew who Guo Yan Shen was when I was 14 years old. So I was like, you do Yichuan? And he was like, you care? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you Probably not that many Yichuan. people knew what that was at that point. <laughs> yeah, and let alone know who Guo Yan Shen was and was excited yeah. about like learning it and standing still. He yeah. was, so he was like, yeah. I'll show you that. So I got into that and the Xingyi, you know, is part and parcel of all of that, really. It's the mother of it. Yeah. And he taught Baguajan also, which he called Pakwa. Right. I studied that also. The five animal frolics, the eight brocades, the muscle tendon change, the Madame Guolin's training and all this stuff like had like crazy details yeah compared to other teachers who i'd be like hey what's the difference between raise hands up and play guitar and they're like oh left side right side and i'm like thank you and then like i meet bp chan what's the first thing he's teaching is an exercise where you change advancing going up forward and raise hands up from side to side and standing in it and then going backwards and play guitar, but with the corresponding circles that were different. And I was like, huh, he knows exactly what this is. Right. And he taught something called Ping Lu Qian, which I also teach, which is 
like a martial application of, of grass bird's tail or ward off rollback press and push from traditional Tai Chi Chuan. That's very martial. And when I saw those two things, I was like, ah, I got to study with him. And the rest is just history. You know, I chased after him, his top students. Like William Chen introduced me to David Ponkadation and said, you know, he's very good in push hands. You should study with him. He dragged me and sat me down with him at his birthday party. So David ended up coming here twice a week and staying overnight twice a week. And like we would train for several hours together and then hang out all day. And that went on for like seven or eight years. I studied privately with another senior brother for 17 years. So, and all this would happen like at the same time. So I would wake up in the morning, go to New York City, and do an hour long private lesson with David Ponkadation. Then I'd go over to Williams School and do an hour push hands with Dr. Tao and Max. And then Max and I would free spar for usually a couple hours, two or three hours, and get dinner and then go back and do Williams three classes a night or whatever he had. So, yeah, to say, uh, that's why William said, when people ask you how long you've been doing this, tell them in hours, not in years. <laughs> <laughs> because I pretty much have to remember that. I've been obsessed with it, you know what I mean? Yeah, oh, I understand. Yeah. I, I I do want to talk a little bit more, I, you know, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit more about BP Chan because for some reason, uh, the younger generation right now uh, seems to overlook that name. A lot of people don't know that much about him. Most people know who William C.C. Chen is, you know, but right, right. Um, uh, before, before we do that, though, I wanted to kind of go back to the, to you went from the, the Tang Soo Do to the Tai Chi. Um, was, was that a big, uh, what, what, what prompted that? Is it just the quality of the teachers that you found or? No, what, what prompted it was my respiratory issues. I was oh, okay. And when I was a kid, my cousin, I, I could still see him opening up his top drawer and pulling out a clipping and reading me about Chang Man Ching and his tuberculosis. Right. Yeah. And all that. And it was like, you know, it just stuck in my head. So years later when I'm reading Chinese boxing masters <laughs> and methods and I'm reading about Chang Man Ching, I'm like, oh, this is the guy yeah. that my cousin was telling me about. And then, you know, William Chen, I already knew he was in New York City because of the oriental world of self-defense with Aaron Banks and all that stuff from the 70s. And I was familiar with his name. So at one point, I, when I saw that he grew up and lived in, in Chang Man Ching's house with him, I was like, huh, I should try and meet him. So this is before internet. I mean, in the old days, yeah. you didn't just go like, clickety, clickety, clack, who do I want to study with? Let right. me see if they can mail me stuff. And their most intense secret skills I can learn online. Yeah. And, um, it wasn't any of that, you know? So I like called information in New York City and was like, William C.C. C. Chen. And they're like, please hold. The phone rings, he picks up. And I'm like, Hello, Mr. Chen. You know, I'm like bowing in my house. Yeah, yeah, over the phone. <laughs> yeah. And he said, oh, yeah, you come on down. It was like real nice to me. I went down there. I signed up for a year, like and paid him for the year in advance. And I bought two T-shirts and I bought a video of him doing Tai Chi, formed by the lake and soared by the lake. And, and you know, that's where it all started. And the other teachers were kind of pushed in front of me. I wouldn't... It, I've never had the intention or mindset to like go around a teacher to their teacher or something that's very common nowadays. You know, people will like kick, push aside their teacher to be yeah. who taught you. Right. Yeah. And not necessarily who taught you ends up being as good as you sometimes. Yeah. It gets interesting out there. So it's, it's, uh, it's weird though the current situation with martial arts, but that's how I got into it was basically because of the respiratory thing, and uh, I and I knew that the highest form was was sip sam se, thirteen posture. So I was like, well, let me just take a look at that directly, 
and deal with my respiratory at the same time. I mean, I really didn't think, I didn't go to it for anything but health. I was like, I know how to fight. Yeah. I did, I sparred every day since I was like 10 years old yeah. till like I was probably 25, you know, and literally every day. Yeah. So it was like, I know how to fight. <laughs> I'm not concerned with it. And I had my throat slit. I don't know if you can see here when I was a kid. Oh, so wow. like none of this is stuff I I did like just for shits and giggles. Right. Pardon the expression, you know, or like a hobby. It was always right. from a serious vantage yeah. point. Yeah. And did the um did the tai, tai Chi help your I know it helped your respiratory issues. I'm sure it did. Yeah. I know a lot of yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And what's funny about it is even if you do it poorly, which of course I was in the beginning, you still get the benefits from it. Yeah. hundred percent. Let alone when you start getting better at it, you know, so years down the road, I was teaching in a, uh, cause William Chen authorized me to teach relatively quickly. <laughs> and I, I kind of snickered at it and didn't do anything, but life's circumstances led me to a state of unemployment where I was like, Hmm. And I was like, well, you could teach here at this health club. So I started teaching like a, a year after I was authorized. And um, because I took that seriously, I continued to study and I still continue to study. I study with anyone that I think has exceptional skills that I, if there's a way that I can do it, if, you know, if I don't have money and they offer it to me, I eat it up. If if I have money, you know, I try to, you know, right. pay and study from multiple teachers. But I don't really, I don't do it necessarily. I like I'll preserve what I learned from them as a separate entity where I could teach it from stem to stern. But I'm more looking at intersections of their interpretations of exercises that we both already have in common in our own arts because there's different different lineages of young family and young style tai chi have different dong fa with the intent of certain achievements and you know you when you learn like three or four different ones you're kind of like well this one i like the best but all the stuff i learned from mr chan was like that all the stuff he did was old school you know yeah. So like step up, intercept and punch has the kick in it, you know, and things like that. It wasn't your basic um, castrata Tai Chi. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's you a vibe. Yeah. So like BP Chan was a product of uh, the Jingwu Association, right? Is is that where he uh, trained? Well, I, I, I think Mark Wiley knows the name of the association that he was involved with. If you were to talk to Mark Wiley, because he told me, but it's something that like no one else I knew understood and missed or, or knew. So, but there was a, an association in the Philippines. Oh, okay. Cause he did, he did a lot of, he lived in the Philippines for a while and trained yeah. there. And like his arms were covered in knife wounds. You could see like he tested this stuff out, you know. Yeah. And um, essentially, um, he was very enigmatic, you know. And there's a lot of like folklore kind of stories that go around around him. But one of the things that he used to say when people would try and pin him down on lineage is he would be like, who you want to learning from, me or my teacher? Yeah. And I understand that more the older I get because it's like people keep trying to go back, which basically suggests that the guys in the middle had no right brought nothing to the game that was an upgrade. Right. And I think that's a mistake a lot of people make. So, you know, he might have been doing it from there. There's also been some stories about someone getting killed and because we didn't even know his name until his funeral. Yeah. He'd be like, oh, I have my own gas station. <laughs> his name was Bun Pyok Chan. Bun means like knowledge 
and Piak is like a tall, straight, flexible tree. And Guillermo was also because he was from the Philippines. Right. He had Guillermo, which is William. Right. And um, but he was very, you know, if you tried to ask him about that stuff, he was cagey about it. And you didn't know if it was because of politics or these stories were true or whatever, you know, but um so I'll, I'll tell you the one story. Love to hear it. So essentially, his brother trained at a temple. And because his brother did, he could train there as well. And, but he couldn't become a monk. And supposedly one of his friends wanted to train there also. And he brought his friend to train there. And what they gave him to do is they had a table with like butcher paper on it. And they were like, take this paper in your hand and scrunch it into a ball yeah. and then smooth it out. Just keep doing this, you know? And you know, this was the training. And supposedly one day they were waiting to get on a train and something happened, an altercation. And this guy stepped to his friend and he went like, stop, put his hand on him and like killed the guy. So he ended up like, you know, coming to the U.S. to hide is the story I heard. Which is like, well, why wouldn't your friend just go hide, you know? Right. So who knows? But he also said to me one day, like, if you looked at his two hands, they were different. Yeah. So I asked him about it and he goes, well, we only train one hand, like with iron palm, right. which he also taught. <clears throat> and he goes, we only train one hand in our lineage. And I said, why is that? And he goes, because you don't want to accidentally pull the skin off your granddaughter when you pick her up. Yeah. And I was like, what are you talking about? But like he had some gnarly looking, but not in like a Morio Higaona Gojo Ru yeah. kind of way, but just yeah. like in a old bonsai tree kind of a way, you know? Yeah. And like I said, his arm was all cut up. Like it was clear that he, wasn't just doing sport based things wherever he trained. But um yeah, he was very enigmatic that way and ultimately was kind of like, you know, a lot of famous teachers have a lot of students, but they don't ever rise up. So kind of like stand on your own feet. Yeah. You know, everything he taught us we had to believe analyze using experiential knowledge and wisdom prove uh, do like practice it and then prove so everything i ever learned from him is gone through that filter and the other filter of his was how to prepare to do one move which basically i have an expression that goes um knowledge that's not integrated is no better than a book on a shelf yeah true sure. And so many people, like, they go on a course and they're clicking around and jumping ahead and like, oh, here's the muscle tendon change exerciser. I want to buy this because teacher X is selling it or whatever. And it's like, you can't you know, pass, go and collect $200. You have to go in an orderly way yeah, and grow. Nice. And like anything I learned that was above my pay grade, I would practice it so I wouldn't forget it, but I would train the other things. So like the eight brocades, I trained um, for probably seven, eight years before I started looking at the other more advanced stuff. While brothers of mine were like, I learned the uh, 10 Taoist set and mm -hmm. this and that. And I was like, so, you know, right? pretty much anything that I would understand as a movement principle I put into the template of the eight chi, uh, the uh, eight brocades. 
And that's what I would teach the people when I started helping people with diseases, like people who had cancer or osteonecrosis or whatever. And I would show them this stuff. Like I taught a guy with brain cancer for 14 years for free. I said to his wife, if you can get him to my house, I'll teach him for nothing. Yeah. Sunday morning before I go to work. So he'd come over at seven o'clock on Sunday morning. And this went on for 14 years. And I found out later on that he was only given two to three months to survive and 0% chance of survival. And uh, when he got sick again years later, I said, I have to ask, in the interest of knowledge, are you not training anymore or is the art not working anymore? And he said, I stopped training several years ago because the doctors told me that like, you know, once you survived it like seven years, all your cells have been rebuilt. And I said, but I told you never to stop training. And he's like, I know. And I'm like, all right. I just wanted to be sure what the deal was. So he had stopped like three years prior, but it still took three years for it to catch up with him again. And I taught other people with like, you know, illnesses, an artist. Um, I won't mention their name but who had gotten, you know, testicular and basically, you know, too much marijuana use weakens the kidney yin. And, but like as a musician, he's got no medical. So like one day he comes to me and he's like, you know, seven years ago, I got this problem. So I would do the eight brocades and the standing set and the swaying and all that you taught me. And the pain would go away and it would shrink down. And then he'd stop doing it. Yeah. And he did that for like seven or eight years. And I was like, bro, you don't just like slap it around like you right. kill it. Yeah. You know, but the point is, is, you know, that's that's what my course is essentially is teaching that set. Because anyone who wants to study with me and say my name relative to them, they got to learn that first. And then after that, like I teach all the other stuff, the longevity breathing or the three treasures breathing or the, the, the massage, all the, you know, acupoint massage and all that stuff. I mean, I, I learned a, a ridiculous amount of stuff. That's why I take it all and put it into the template of the brocade. So this way in a half hour a day, I'm practicing the essence of everything I know in movement, you know? Yeah, a lot of people look at it like, oh, that's just a basic Qigong. I want to learn the super flaming ninja Qigong, right. you know, and it's like, okay. Yeah, there's a reason why it's so common to set. You know, it's because it, it it treats what ails you, you know, and it's a, um, you know, it works your entire body, you know, at, at the very least. Um, was your Qigong training, uh, was that something that started at the same time as your Tai Chi training, or was that something that you pursued after you, you began Tai well, chi. William just taught his form. It started when I started with Mr. Chan. Okay. And, you know, like once I was like, you do each one. And he was like, you care. That was like the beginning of it. And I started learning the eight brocades. And I remember thinking like, yeah, you know, this is basic stuff. Mm -hmm. Especially for a guy who can learn a form, like sitting in a chair and watching you do it, you know? Right. So... <clears throat> Um, I didn't first perceive its value. And then one day I touched one of my brothers who at the time in that school was a junior brother of mine, even though he had years of training with other teachers before in that school, he was my junior brother. And I used to teach him some Tai Chi and such. And I touched him and I was like, Whoa, like, what are you doing? And he's like, what do you mean? Cause he was like one of those guys who does like what the teacher says <laughs> right yeah those guys you know so i was like okay back to the drawing board and i went back to the brocades with like a fervor and then i just never left you know and all the other stuff i i practice and train from the same vantage point so what what are because that's the language of movement you know once you learn the language i speak then i could teach you a million forms but I, if I teach you a million forms and you don't understand what the eyes guide and guard means, 
then you don't know how to attach intention and spirit to movement. You don't know how to open and close the spine. You don't know how to do a lot of stuff. Then it becomes, you know, just a waste of time. And then I feel like I'm robbing someone. It's like, I, I basically said to someone one time, because I could see they weren't getting it. I said, look, I'm trying to leave this as if I'm leaving it to my son. I'm trying to teach it as if you're the last student on earth I have to teach. I'm trying to preserve it. <clears throat> I'm not trying to make money and like sell it a certain way that's going to get a lot of people to be like and throw me money. I'm trying to really do the right thing. And I'm telling you exactly what to do and when to do it. You know, and I had a student who lived here with me for 11 years. And like I get up in the middle of the night and he's doing Santi at three o'clock in the morning. And he's like, well, because the lung meridian is open then. Yeah. That's the metal element. Metal is the mother of water. Right. You know, in Santi, you're stretching the lung meridian here. So he started doing it because he did it with me and he got like some feedback on it. So he told me the feedback. He goes, well, when I do the training at night, I get up and I do that. He goes, I go to school and I don't even have to take notes anymore. It just sticks in my head. And he goes, and I can, you know, have sex with my girlfriend like seven times in one night. So I'm like, huh, why don't you make it like three times and like bank the rest of it, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. But the point of the matter is, is he noticed the difference in his physicality and his power and his energy like right away. And so it wasn't like I had to tell him, get up and train with me, you know, he yeah. would just do it because that's really the optimal time for doing certain types of training. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that because I noticed in your, um, in your blog and in your YouTube videos, things like that, which are really inspiring, by the way, they, they make you want to train when they read your blog entries. And oh, thanks. but uh, I noticed that you do uh, talk quite a bit about the, um, uh, health benefits of Xingyi. And, you know, some teachers don't, you know, some teachers are uh, even some Chinese teachers, you know, are kind of like, no, you know, there's no connection between the meridians or the elements and, and the Xingyi practice. And, um, but, but some do, um, some are, you know, pretty adamant that there is a connection. Um, uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Could you talk about how sure. that was presented to you when you were learning it? Well, a lot of it is what I was taught and a lot of it is what I explored. Because again, based on Mr. Chan's concept of how to prepare to do one move, like which is about integrating all your knowledge. And the other is about, you know, believe, analyze, do, and prove. So when I first did everything I did, I looked at it through the one chi. So I would see that if I was standing like this and I moved like that, that my whole posture would crumble. So if I broke any center in any joint, the whole posture was out. So I started looking at things through the one chi, and then I put on yin and yang goggles. And that's when you start to interact with dynamic equilibrium with, you know, my t-shirt that I made years ago, which I'm, in the process of remaking right now, on the back says, stand like a balance, turn like a wheel. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I can see it. Because that to me is the essence of the classics. If you're not doing that, you're mimicking entirely everything. When you're standing like a balance, truly, then any defect you make will be like, um, excuse me, we're a defect. And it'll tell you. And you no longer copy a teacher because they do a thing a certain way. You look at it and you feel it in your body and you feel in or out of center. The concept of when I go forward, I must consider back. When I go up, I must consider down. These things become, you know, words you live by. You know, so even if I reach out for a cup of coffee or something else, this is actually... High grade dark chocolate. 
I'm, I'm playing with that a little bit. Um, the point is, is that if you do these, you start to think differently about what you do, you know, in terms of does it integrate the knowledge I have or am I just forgetting that knowledge throughout every single thing I do? So from there, when, you know, the five elements and the five elements integrated the five fists of Xing Yi, the five animal frolics, the, you know, the Zong and Fu organ sets in the body. And in the process of that, I did that study myself where I would like read, explore, read, explore, and, and stay on the five elements. Like I haven't moved into the eight changes yet. You know, which is why you don't see me doing a bunch of Paqua videos. I do Paqua, but I don't, I don't consider my, I'm not done with the five elements. And, you know, so what I've done in, in the eight brocades and in, you know, the healing sounds, for example, the five tastes, the five senses on your head and your, your limbs and your tips and integrating, you know, intention with movement and the sequencing of intention and all these sort of things. These are things I'm exploring in the five element realm. So when you sit there, for example, and you see someone doing Santi differently than you do, yeah. and you're like, well, that's not what we do, you know? And it turns into a, he said, she said type of thing. Whereas to me, it was like, I don't do that. That wasn't what Mr. Chan was teaching. He was teaching to investigate it. Right. So I investigate it. So I see that, you know, the long meridian starts in the shoulder nest and comes down to the thumb and the large intestine meridian comes back up and into the shoulder nest. Right. Right. So that's your metal element. Right. So when I'm doing Santi, if I'm standing with my torso square to you, I'm closing this off. But if I allow my feet to place my hips, then this arm is more extended this way and this is open more. Right. And if you push across, you can test it. So if someone is standing there and you push across and they're open properly, they you can't close them up. But if they just get into a, a shape that has a lot of, you know, potential energy in, stored in it. You know, the idea is to get to equilibrium where there's no push and pull in the muscles to hold you up anymore. You're literally yeah. teetering, which is why when I, when someone, when I defect my posture and someone pushes me, you'll see me bounce away in a weird way because I'm never holding. Like I'm, one, one, a guy who studies with me who's got like 18 years more shingy than me is like, he goes, you stand like really light. And I'm like, it's not about getting like, hell, sinking everything. It's about clearing the body so that the chi can sink. <clears throat> not that you yourself become heavy, but that you become empty. And then any force that comes into you just goes like, and grounds out and hits the ground. It's not about me trying to get heavy sitting there, according to my understanding. And again, I'm just saying this because this is my my uh, experience and what I feel on it. It's not to say that another person's way isn't doesn't bear fruit or isn't good to do or whatever. But according to my understanding, that's where I'm at. So in the eight brocades, when you first start doing it, it's. It's Y Gong. It's basically external work. Your hand position and your your eye direction and your breathing influence internal chi flow without you knowing diddly about it or even considering it. But over time, you start to see the same thing. So you see in a ritual that someone does in Java that they clear down their gallbladder meridians, and you're like, huh, interesting. Or in very high level 
Tai Chi, you'll see them, you know, open up and then, you know, come back and come down their gallbladder meridians before they close out. And, you know, you find out that clearing the gallbladder meridians are very critical to getting rid of content that can cause negative energies to just stay in the body. So then you look at it more carefully and then you start to go, well, gallbladder, you know, when you do looking back seven times yeah. to rid the body of the five uh, uh, injuries and seven toils, like I would, I would initially look back, press my hands down on my head up to stretch the traps and to physically just stretch the tissue like you would do before a run. Right. Any stretch. And I would, train it that way for a while looking for mobility and and stretch but now it's a different animal now like you know gallbladder one is right here so when i look towards it i activate gallbladder one and then it goes back to here and then up to here then down and around the ear and up around the gallbladder 14 and down the back down past gallbladder 21 around the shoulder you know and, you, and like i know it's path and I will guide it through that path by releasing the path. I call it, you know, opening the doors for the emperor, but don't touch the emperor. And don't look at the emperor. So it's like if I'm bringing, walking with the emperor to some place, I don't look at him, you know, and I don't touch him. So I don't look at my chi. Right. And I don't try to guide my chi and touch it. I simply open the doors before the chi gets there, creating emptiness that the chi will fall into. And the chi moves towards the emptiness. And this is how you guide it down through. So at a higher level, you know, I might turn and, and look and get like a general down the side, like a, 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 a wave. Yeah. But the better I get at it, the more I'll try to open the doors and not touch it and not look at it so that, you know, I'm doing that. When I'm doing this with like the second brocade, I'm get, you're gathering chi into the, into the heart lung area. And then you're expressing heat out of the pericardium nine point when you're doing this to get rid of excess. Right. Heat and energy, yeah, <clears throat> exactly. And then, if you want to do it for the lungs, you do this position. You know, you see people do this, right? <clears throat> right. So there's, they're not like one's right and one's wrong to me. It's like, what are you trying to get rid of? <laughs> yeah. You know. So each, you know, when you're doing like lion shakes his tail, you're stretching the heart meridian, right? Right. You let heart fire down so yeah i look at these things through that vantage point mm -hmm. as well as like building a dantian building a, a vertical circle a horizontal circle and a sagittal circle in the first three brocades so everything i every time i practice these things i'm clear in the meridians i'm rising and falling the chi I'm using the eyes to guide and guard the chi, which is when you start to integrate E or intention. Right. And um, and Shen is through these these kind of practices. So, you know, everything really, if a person only ever just learned, really learned this first like six months of my course. <laughs> they could pretty much do almost anything if they really learned it. It's just a matter of if they really learn it and don't go, oh, yeah, keep the joints in center. Right. On to the next thing. And it's like, no, like, do you do that? And that's one of Ben Lowe's things. If you know, then why not you do? Right. Right. You know? So when um, you say that you um, use sort of the brocades as like a template for everything that you teach, <clears throat> Say that a, a student like takes your course, uh, is that the very first thing that you teach and then everything else in the Tai Chi, Xingyi, whatever it else is that you're teaching branches out from that? Or what's the specific? Um... Well, 
that's basically the language of okay. movement. So yes. like, and it also is basically the one thing I would teach you of all the stuff I know in the world, if I could only teach you one thing, it's the thing that I teach to the people with the brain cancer or the osteonecrosis or this cancer or that disease or this disease. It's, you know, so what I teach is the sway show, which is a swaying exercise, which there's a whole cult of that in China where that's their entire training is that. I teach that with some open and close, rise and fall movements. And then a Yang Sheng set from Yi Chuan, like a health preservation set that covers, you know, all the bases pretty much in, in Yi Chuan for health preservation. And then I teach the eight brocades. And, you know, silk reeling I'll teach also as, as a thing that's like, well, you really got to learn these things. And if you really learn just those things, you don't need a whole lot more really, you know, push hands, things like that. But essentially the meat and potatoes is in all of that stuff. So if I'm going to bring my hands from side center to here, if I'm standing like a balance, I'll tip forward when I do that. If I can take my hands from side center and bring them to here without moving, it's because my feet are holding, my core is holding and everything's holding. So I'm not open and loose. You know, Mr. Chan, when you, I said to him one time, like, why do we do this stuff? Cause I thought it was kind of self-centered and he gave me two different answers on a couple of occasions. And the one answer was, we do it because it is to our liking. Don't make it complicated. In other words, you're wired this way, and this is right, why yeah. you do it. Yeah. The end. That's the, the best answer was, I've ever heard. <laughs> the, 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 the even more profound thing he would say is, because I want to know in whose hand this is. And I'm looking at him like, uh-huh. What do you mean? And he goes, well, if I'm standing here, I can touch in here and here and here. But if I touch in here, I fall out. Because he's standing like a balance. And I was like, and I, I, I remember going just like this. I went like, I can stand like that all day, you know, as a joke. Yeah, yeah. And I was going like this to my hand, which first of all isn't true. And thank God he didn't make me prove it. Yeah. But um, eventually when you stand like a balance and then you decide to do this, you know, something happens. And you do this and something happens. And like you flare your elbows, something happens. You puff your chest, something happens. You do this with your head, something happens. And eventually you start to become connected via awareness, which is the big thing about my course is that this, all this stuff, when you can learn to keep your attention on all these things, you become a spider web yeah. of awareness. Like not one joint can be moved without it telling all the others. Right. Right. So then eventually, like, even if you see a guy who's doing like Santé, mm -hmm. And he's got his hand here, or he's got his hand here. Like you just like gravity tell you, if it pulls you out, yeah, it's not right. Right. And like where I put it, when I put it in the right place, then suddenly my muscles on the negative and positive element of my musculature is as close to zero as can be. And I'm as close to empty as I can be. You know, so like, if you look at some old pictures of Mr. Chan doing brush knee, he's coming from here. But when I'm here, my heels are like, but when I come to here, my heels aren't light, nor, is, nor are my toes. But if I come to here, my toes are light. So you tune it in. And when you find that spot, no one can argue with you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you're just like yeah i know what he used to do you know but right. and i'll have people hold my arm from here and i'll be like 
I can't go into the next part of the posture. But I'll take my arm and insert it into the center, poof, like that while they're holding it. They're like, whoa. And then I just go to the next move. When you move from center to center to center, which is something I teach in the course that most people are like, eh, like you become, the second you do it, you become more powerful. It's not like do that for eight months, do that for a hundred days. It's like, no, the minute you do it, you're powerful. So, but you got to find what center is. I used to think it was just the Dantian. And Mr. Chan's like, well, you're out of center. And I'm standing there in a brush knee posture with my hand out here. And he wanted my hand in a triangulation. And he basically like put his chest on my hand and walked forward and knocked me backwards. Took my hand to here, put his chest on and walked forward. And I could stay there very comfortably. So I was like, oh, so center becomes centers eventually. And you start to, you start to look at all the different places in your body that are in and out of center. That's why any of these things, like I'll teach that in one video and I'll have a student stand there and I'll show, like one I'll show is, he used to call this beggar's wrist. You know, this thing. Mm -hmm. The classics would say no hollows, no protuberances. Right. Right. Um, but he called it beggar's wrist. He'd be like, no beggar's wrist. So, you know, I, and I, I didn't get it at first. But like if I stood in a posture like this and got all my act together enough that if you push on my forearm with a testing force, you're not like trying to plow through me, you're, you're helping to nurture me, right, with right. some force. And I can, like, sit there and just relax and have my head up and, like, hold you there, hold you off with the structure. Then I can get sung. If I line the bones upright, then the musculature can relax. So I do that. And then if I have you turn your wrist like this, on this hand and I push here, your whole posture goes crazy. So then I have you fix it. This I teach literally in my first class, like all the time with someone. Then I bring them back to here and I push on them and they, they're they solid. And then I'll be like, defect that wrist. And I push on this arm and again, because I, Mr. Chan said to me one day when I was proud of myself and I said, Last night I did the form, you know, one time each for each of Yang Cheng Fu's 10 essential principles. And he's like, oh, that's good. He goes, but if one center out, they all out. Yeah. And I was like, what? The, like, what are you talking about? No one talks about this stuff. Yeah. No one I've ever met talks about this stuff. And basically... You know, when you see Ma Yu Liang like bouncing people out and being like this, he talks about this stuff to somebody. Like I see it. You know, like when I see a person, when you do brush knee, this hand is here. It's not here. It's not there. You know? Right. When you when you start, so you look at other people doing things and they're the way they're doing it, you're like, huh. That, it's like a violation. This helps you to like be able to look at someone and see what you can do or, or really the depth of their knowledge, like in a glance. It's like and he doesn't understand centers at all, so I'm going to make him pay. The big thing about following is you simply, you know, let a person's own greediness pull them out of center, and then you take advantage of that. Or you coax them out of center by putting a light pressure on them where they get defensive and they start to do that. Or if you make them miss, they endeavor to come back to center. Like if a person falls, their subconscious is going to snap them back to center. Right. So what you do is you follow adding four ounces 
to their subconscious correction. And then they're just like, <laughs> they're all out of whack because they can't even feel that they're correcting. Yeah, you had you know, a... Uh... That's where following skill like becomes more of a finesse thing. I mean, even, even traditional push hands... You know, I did, I've done the wrestling push hands where you put your hand on someone's chest and all that stuff. Yeah. But there's no pattern. And the people that are, are champions will be like, yeah, that pattern is like bullshit. You know, you just want to get right to like the meat and potatoes of like this and like give them force. Right. It's like, no, that doesn't con comply with the classics. No force. So if you're using force, you're already well. You got to use force. What are you talking about? Have you won championships? You know, so people will say to me, they'll curse at me online and stuff. It's unreal, and it's like meanwhile I'm trying to help them. But um, no, you don't want to use any force when we're if you and I are practicing any pattern and push hands, then we have a constant which is a scientific concept. We have a known. So any energetic expressions that I feel moving outside of that pattern are your subconscious at work, what I call your dog. So I'm like, you're letting your dog pull you out. Thank you for a walk. Heal your dog and let him follow you around and tell him who to bite later. But for now, don't let him drag you around. You look stupid and it's a waste of strength, right? So essentially you, you touch a person and they're endeavoring to push you like, and you're going to roll them back and pull them to this side, but their subconscious is like, <laughs> no, he's not. We're going to push him to this side. So then I follow that push and add four ounces to it. And they'll be like, like, how did I fall out to that direction? They won't even understand it. So, like, traditional push hands is a dual nurturing exercise where both practitioners' goal is to nurture each other. So I'm sitting there telling you what where your dog is defensively pulling you out, and you're telling me where my dog is offensively pulling me out, and we switch back and forth with that. And that we can start to identify the unconscious movement in our own defensive situations, which is simply a dispersing of our knowledge and of our skill and not a focusing of it. It's like taking a laser and turning it into a spotlight. It's like your energy is all over the place. It's not working as a team. So when... When I push with someone, I endeavor to follow their subconscious expressions that they don't know they're doing. And that's best practiced in a patterned method. And with that, in a much quicker realization, you can start to acquire what's called Boudoui Bouding which is often translated as don't insist, don't resist. And essentially, like if I cross hands with you and I take my hand away and you're like doing that, like there's, where's the stillness? Where's the calm? Right. All I see is a herky jerky subconscious movement that you don't even know is going on. So a lot of times I, if I, before I do push hands with someone, I'll, cross hands with them and take my hand away a bunch of times to show them like, look what you're doing and get them to trim it back. So now they're starting to get control of their dog. Then you do push hands there and it becomes like, okay, there's not a lot for me to follow here and take advantage of because their dog is following them, not dragging them. So these are all like, you know, traditional, I'm, I'm very traditional in my training and thinking. And when you start to look at it the right way, then you're like, ah, because none of the magic happens until you have boudoui boudin, none of it. Or until you're standing like a balance and turning like a wheel. Like when I turn to do this, 
in the second brocade, I don't turn my body. I release my joints and let it turn, which means first I have the intention for it to turn, which causes the Dantian to wind. Because I'll say to people, I'll go, why, why didn't you just drop straight down when you released your hip joints? Why did you turn left or right? Because you had the intent to do that. So you've already been using your Dantian and don't even know it, right? But then when you make a power where the joints are open like that, you can't, the person, when they push back against it, there's no bridge between the torso to the leg. But when I engage my tendons, there's always a bridge. So if I, if I issue force on you this way, and you receive it with like a ward off or you're holding my arms or whatever. And I'm releasing, you know, root middle tip to cause the chi to flow out my arms. Um, essentially, the part that people don't realize is the minute I open the shoulder joint, I break the connection between my arm and my torso. So your resistant force no longer comes back into my body. So now I can keep building pressure on you. And then when you go to get pressure on me again, then I release the elbow. Then when you go to get pressure on me again, then I release the wrist. So you don't just go like shoulder, elbow, wrist, shoulder, like a wave and just like release it sequentially. That doesn't really do shit. It's when you, feel that the force is starting. I, I'll let, let the force start to actually come into me where it's about to push me back. And then I'll release the shoulder because now I suckered the person into a high degree of confidence and thinking, oh, I got him. He's tipping back. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, the power keeps building. That's the, the real magic of like the sequencing is to not just let it happen quick, but to do it both defensively and offensively at the same time and know that you're doing that. And when you do that, you know, if I put my arms on top of yours and I go to push down, you'll stand there like this and hold me like this, no problem. But then if I release the shoulders, then the elbows, then the wrists, then I might get a better result. Now, if I, if I went from a, a closed spine to an open spine, then the energy from closed to open wants to leave my torso, but I hold it there. And then I release the shoulder, then the elbow, then the wrist. And it's always like, ah, because I saved the energy. I didn't let it spill, you know? So you have to, these are all like little things that I try to teach. So every time I'm doing the brocade, when I'm coming here, you know, when I'm here, my thumbs are down. My spine is in a closed position. I open the spine. And the arms come up and separate, but the thumbs are still down in a closed position. And then I release shoulder, elbow, wrist. And now the thumbs are in an up position and they're open position. So I learned to take the stored gin of my spine and transfer it into my arms when I want. Right? So this is all I taught in this brocade set that I teach, you know, at different That's levels. That's a lot of highly detailed information. That's really valuable. Uh, well, most people don't even get into the meridians that are in there, let alone anything like this. To me, it's, it's a receptacle of all my knowledge. Put into a nice half hour a day exercise set that I can bang out, you know, and then however long you want to stand for. Or if you stand at all, you know, like you don't necessarily have to do that on a daily basis. You know, once you acquire what standing is trying to teach you, you know, and right. um, so, yeah, this is this is like the basic idea of what I'm trying to get across in this simple what appears to be simple set. And ultimately, the skills become like. You know, I've been doing this for over 30 years in terms of like with William Chen, I started in 94. You know, 50 years is all my martial arts. Right. But, um, 
Yeah, like I got students that are working on stuff I'm working on right now. And I said, and he's like, oh, geez, I got to like retool this. And I'm like, dude, you wanted me to be honest with you. And I'm giving you state of the art. Like you can run along next to me or you can dawdle over there. You know, I was talking to a guy who's a teacher in Europe that I teach. And I said to him, I said, look, like metaphorically, internal arts has been this. I struggle climbing a mountain and I finally get to the top of the mountain only to see a much deeper canyon and a much taller mountain. Yeah. And I said, and what, what I see in the world is most of the people that get to one of those peaks just go up. None of these people can see that other mountain. So right. screw it. Yeah. I said, but like, principles i've lived by have been turned on their head by that other mountain so when i keep looking towards the other mountain and go oh god here we go again you know things keep changing i said to where like physics isn't even kind of part of it anymore I said i'm a gemologist so like i'm into science and shit like that you know i said but like you know some of the things i do will be like Imagine you're holding a, a heavy bundle and you let it drop, only gravity falls sideways. And that's like, what do you mean? And it's like, ah, that's the best I can explain it. You know? Yeah. And, and um, you know. I think that's, that's one of the good mean. things about this, uh, these arts that we do is that there's no end, or seemingly no end. But you're right. A lot of people, you know, the end is wherever point. any particular practitioner decides to make it. Yeah. Yeah. Typically. Yeah. But there is no end. It's not even close. Right. In fact, like you just end up with a better view of your incompetence, pretty much. You know, right. Mr. Chan, when I first started learning, I was like, I want to like master each posture before going on to the next. You know, and I did that for like, I feel like a couple of months. You know, or I'm trying to do the opening and all this stuff. And finally, he's like, you know, there is no mastery. He's like, there's only worse and worse. Yeah, that's the, that's the terrible truth. <laughs> it's pretty much it's what great. it is. Yeah, it's great. I, I think one of the things that interests me about what's what's going on right now or what's seemingly going on right now, like, for instance, with your teaching, you know, you're very detailed. You give very common sense explanations of, of things. That didn't used to be the case. Like even my first teacher it was sure. just sort of like you watched them and you could do it or not do it. And, you know, it was just, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, verbal instruction or even like explanation of the physics behind things. But it seems like there's more of a trend towards that type of teaching now. So it's possible for people to progress further, faster, but they're still not the type of human being that, that has the... Uh, stick to itness to do that you know there's not a whole lot of people like people, that out. you know tech modern technology makes it that people don't have the attention span they want right to. exactly yeah it's it's a kind of a, a very difficult situation that could lead to these things becoming i mean the arts have been challenged throughout history for numerous reasons political and religious and other things. And, you know, usually anyone who gets a real taste of this stuff is like, I'm not letting go of this. I don't care like what right. you do to me. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? So there will, there will probably always be a small clutch of people here and there that will hold on to these things. And, you know, with Mr. Chan, if you asked him a question, he was an old school teacher. He had an expression that he'd say, if you teach them too plainly, you give them only spare parts. Mm. Because on the way to your comprehension, there's a whole lot of failure in there that becomes part of the global knowledge. Right. And it's right. within that failure that you really have understanding. So he would say, if you'd ask him a question like, Hey, how do I do that? You know, or how did you do that? Or, Something like that, you go, oh, that's a good question. You should ask in your teacher. And I'd be like, what the? F like, <laughs> um, am I not paying you enough? Like, what do you mean? Right. And what it was, was like, ask your body. 
Right. So when I ask my body, where does this hand go? I don't care what my teacher said. Right. I literally investigated outside of the scope of his, where he left it. You know what I mean? So like yeah. we have details, upper hand, middle finger to lower hand index finger. And I've seen that expressed in Sun Lu Tong's book, but we do it all over the place. And like it works or it fails if you don't. And eventually it becomes a thing that you just do without thinking about it. But these details <clears throat> that Mr. Chan taught, like I don't see anybody doing anything close to that anymore, even famous teachers that are very successful. Um, and, you know, that, that knowledge is like, in and of itself is a lifetime study, let alone getting, adding energetics to it, adding intention to it. Because even like when you do standing training, when you first start, you approach it pretty much like a Navy SEAL, like, hoorah! Yeah, stand, stand here all night. Like yeah. Right? Yeah. And then over time, your musculature develops and maybe some willpower. But you're suffering every day and you start to re realize it. And you get into it. And, and then like one day, like your shoulders drop and you're like, Huh? You know, I remember saying to Mr. Chan, I'm like, you know, I was standing like 45 minutes in a posture. I said, and now I can't even stand like a minute. And I'm like out of my mind. And he's like, oh, that's good. He goes, your body is talking to you again. Now you can fix it. So once you start to fix it, then you start to acquire concepts like connection, center, posture alignment all these things start to become refined understandings and then even like looking at it a tree and having it pull you out and then going to peripheral vision and falling back into center becomes like the acquisition of e you know like when you stare and telescope your vision your the e leads the chi leads the shoe leads the shen so the intention leads the chi, leads the blood, leads the body, you know? You feel that when you're standing. When you, when you realize that, like, when your eyes were here and they went to here, that you start to suffer. And you keep bringing your eyes up and they keep going down. And then you go, like, well, let me stare at that tree. And then you start getting pulled on your toes and you can't breathe. You're tight. So then you start to learn, like, Oh, wait, let, let me stop staring at that. And then your body falls right back into center. So then you start adding that telescoping. You know, in the classics, we have advanced retreat, central equilibrium, look left and gaze right. Not look left and look right or gaze left and gaze right. Because they're trying to point something out to people. And I was like, ha. Huh. There's something to this, like years ago. And then once you start to see that, you're like, oh, if I keep looking this way, I pull myself out. But if I gaze, I start to come into center to where I can roll you off and look out and throw you out. Right? Yep. So you start to see the, the how the eyes affect the E. And then, you know, in the classics, when it says, if you concentrate on the Chi, it will become stagnant. Instead, you know, put your mind on the Shen or something to that effect. If I go to do Tai Chi Ruler, which is another system he taught, you know, and for years I was just doing this with the ruler versus like waking up and looking out and letting the Chi fill my arms. And the ruler floats up by itself. And then if I forget to like raise my Shen, then the ruler doesn't do squat. Or if I'm all inwardly looking and thinking, it doesn't do squat either. So you start to see like what needs to be in place, how to prepare to do one move. And then eventually that becomes all everything you do. So every time I'm doing form, I'm looking out and then I'm retracting the vision. And then I'm looking out, I'm retracting the vision. 
you know? And even in Santi, you know, like if you're here and you your Shen raises, the whole thing raises. Right. You know, so you start to you start to see these things, but these aren't easy, easy acquisitions, and the integration of them is even more difficult. Mr. Chan goes, it's easy to get from here to here, but to get from here to here, not so easy. <coughs> and that's pretty Body. much the essence of what it is. Jim, it's been a great talk. We're just about out of time. Um, yeah, yeah, no could worries. you talk to people about uh, where they can find you at? Oh, um, well, let me just pull out my card here. Okay. So I can we'll put a link in the description too. So I'll send you it. the card. Um, on Facebook, I have a group called Zhong Ding Tai Chi Chuan. Okay. Zhong spelled Z H O N G. YouTube is Zhong Ding Tai Chi. Um, Instagram is just Jim Russo. Okay. And, um, you know, our group now is called Jung Ding Tai Chi. And it's a, that's where you can find our course and our various other things that we will be in the process of preparing to sell in the future or whatever. Um, I'll send you these these links for you. Oh, yeah. We'll put links to all that in the description mm -hmm. so that people can find you. Yeah. But it's been an enlightening crazy. talk. I really appreciate you taking time out to talk to me. Yeah. Today. You know, let's do it again sometime. It was really, you know, I'm not casting. I could tell I wasn't casting pearls before swine and that you were here and everything I was saying. So it was a, a blessing for me and a thrill. Oh, no. Pleasure's on my side. It's um, It's always great to be able to talk to somebody that can relate these concepts in a way that people can understand so i really appreciate it that's what i try to do and i and i don't i don't believe in holding anything back because what if i were teaching horn to like john coltrane or yeah basketball to lebron james like why would and i've had teachers in my life that have intentionally held me back the ones i mentioned to you are not those teachers the ones that did, I didn't mention. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I always think that, you know, I've never understood why someone would want it's a it's a poor mark of a teacher whose student doesn't, you know, at least get to their level, if not surpass them. So I, I appreciate that you have that. Me, if you can get better than you know. me, you could maybe enlighten me. Right. That's I guess anything I could happen. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Anyhow. All right. I appreciate Jim. it. So yes, sir. Was... Can you stick around for just a minute? Sure. Okay. Thanks very much. You're welcome.